Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Feeling Seen, the podcast that talks about the movies that make us feel seen. I, as always, am your host, Jordan Cruciola, and I am, as always, joined by a co-host. And my co-host today, if you are out there in the podcast waves, hopefully you are because you're here, uh, you might be familiar with his podcast, The Downside. You might have seen some of his stand-up comedy on Comedy Central, perhaps his special Shelf Life. He's the season eight winner of Comics Watching Comics. I feel like, John Marco Sorezi, you do, uh, you wear many hats, you do a lot of things, so how best can we set you up in an introduction for the people to know what they need to know about you before we commence here today? I I just say a comedian. A comedian? Yeah, that's it. That (laughs) describes it all. Everyone's got so many hyphens these days, just comedian. Well, that's the thing, like, I feel like to say, like, for one, if I was talking to you in 1991 and you were like, I'm a comedian, I feel like I would have a very specific image of what that means and, like, the things that you are getting up to with your, like, hustling time. But I feel like in 2022, to say I'm a comedian, you could have 90,000 jobs, like... To say you're a comedian in 2023... Is, oh, God, uh, you're right. Yeah. To say you're comedian in 2023 is to say that you are a social media manager for yourself. <laughs> yes. That is what it means. That's all that it means. You <laughs> are you. It, it doesn't mean that you know how to tell jokes, but it does mean mm. you know how to use Final Cut. That's <laughs> what a comedian is these days. That was what, like, in my, in my, the idea in my head of, like, the, the multi-hyphenate of what a comedian could be, I would, I would think, like, kind of foremost alongside comedian you know the title also producer like you are constantly producing editing like final cut pro like you are you are your own production company alongside being a comedian i would imagine yeah it's just every day i i i feel like i run my own network Mm -hmm. and unfortunately it's very understaffed there's there's (laughs) one show this one show and, and it's all spinoffs. Mm-hmm. Here's the crowd work spinoff. Here's the mm-hmm. podcast spinoff. And, uh, you know, if the, if the product's not clicking, I'm screwed because it's all I got. So <laughs> and it's, uh, it's all on your singular shoulders. Yeah, it's a lot. I have some people I work with now. Uh, luckily, thank God. But, uh, <laughs> but it's a lot of me for sure. I do think it, I, it it does seem to be that to be a, a comedian in the present moment, it does require a sort of polymath skill set that uh-huh. like you you are some of the most like well-rounded people in entertainment creation because you have you are you are not only live presenters you're not only live entertainers you're also like probably post-production specialists because sure. who else is putting this shit out besides you and like like you said and you have to be social media se- like there's not actually a compartment of the media presentation that you get to like be absolved from until like it's like really firing in all cylinders and maybe you have like a team but For like sure it makes God. me nervous though i feel nervous because like there's no way uh, Mitch Hedberg would have been good at Instagram, no. but no. it gave him space to go get high and <laughs> yeah. then write his his funny little jokes. And mm-hmm. and there there's a lot of times that I get nervous. And I think overall That's the fair. art form where where if you have to be multifaceted, it prevents you from being excellent at the one thing. I, I always say, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis never wrote his own plays. Daniel yeah. Day-Lewis never had to write a short film in order to get his first agent. His yeah. craft. And and I, I, I worry that um, as as every, not just comedians, but actors, every, yeah. perf- every writers, as we are asked to shoulder these responsibilities, mm-hmm. it takes away from the time we have to become great at, at the thing we're supposed to be great at. And ultimately, the quality of everyone's work suffers. If if people are casting based on social media followings, they're going to mm-hmm. get bad actors. There's no there's no way yeah. around it. They'll luck out yeah. once in a while. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, I spend every day doing all this other stuff, and then at yeah. night I squeeze in some jokes. I try to squeeze it in everywhere I can. Which is and, this uh, is this is all just this is all just to say that like I just want to like. The, I want to be cognizant of the fact that I feel like I, I don't know you, but I feel like I know that you do a, a lot 
in the designation of comedian, and I want to recognize that you're putting a lot into being the was singular it, word was of it comedian. The, uh, the unkemptness of my beard that gave it away? <laughs> was it the, the fact that I was late that gave it away? What gave away no. that I have too much on my plate? No, not, no, I, there wasn't a tell. There was, a, it is someone within your professional designation. Yeah. It's just like, I feel like it's one of the most sort of, in the way that people, I feel like just sort of, weekend warrior consumers of movies, they don't realize that every movie that reaches them is actually a miracle. A miracle. Like, that it got made at all is a miracle. And so I just want to make sure and that I am recognizing and, and it, from insofar as a platform that I have being like, hey, the thing you do is actually so much all-encompassing work. And I just want to make sure we establish that to whoever's listening. I'm very critical of, you know, art as one should be. But when you get in the business, sometimes I don't like it when, when artists are like, I remember when like there were live musicals on Fox or ABC and some of <laughs> yeah. them were, were really dreadful. Yeah. And and a lot Gosh. of Broadway people were like, how dare you criticize <laughs> this piece? And it's a, it's a double edged sword because I, you should criticize everything. Yes. But I understand when you're in show business, you're like, yeah, when you say that thing sucks, what you're saying is that <laughs> like a thousand people. Yeah. Their last six months Mm -hmm. was spent making something that just blows, that just (laughs) blows top to bottom. And it's hard. I feel sympathy for them, them too. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. If you didn't like Avatar, then (laughs) there's like a a million people whose work you just spat on. You know what? This isn't disconnected from what we're talking about here today. No, it's not. I feel. This this does feel actually very thematically appropriate. Because you have brought the extremely substantial topic of a character choice of Antonio Salieri, F. Mm. Murray Abraham's character in Amadeus as your character choice today. Yes, yes. I, uh, my, my girlfriend and I actually watched it last night. We would just watch White Lotus season two and she <laughs> didn't know. She didn't know it was F. Murray Abraham. And I was like, yes, he's, he's looked like an old man for quite some time. <laughs> he really has. Uh, yeah. This movie was made out in 1984 and, and F. Murray Abraham has always been a distinguished older gentleman. Yeah. And perfect casting, perfect casting all the way around top yeah. to bottom. And I don't know when I saw it, I probably saw it. Uh, in, in college, I was, I went to college for musical theater uh-huh. Okay, and, um, I just connected to Salieri so, so deeply. That is powerful. Uh, I'm not religious in the way Salieri is like Salieri mm-hmm. really had someone to blame and I'm mm-hmm. almost envious of his <laughs> yeah, ability it's a bit convenient. to externalize who he's mad at. He's mad mm-hmm. at God for choosing Mozart as his vessel. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not a strict atheist, but even in my my wildest conceptions of God, <laughs> it's never like a, you did this, you gave it to them instead of me. Yeah, like but looking at someone in the eyes, being like, how fucking dare you? Yeah, yeah. And and I I related to this so much. I, I chose, I was never, I'm not a big classical music guy, but I tried <laughs> for this movie. I tried to be like, <laughs> can I listen to Mozart and feel... Yeah. The the genius, the god <laughs> Um but but yeah, I saw it and it just it like it shook me to my artist core. And I I it, it, whenever I'm feeling low, this is who I, I relate to the most. Is so Salieri. did you did your girlfriend know when you were watching it together that this was your like representative character and was that a conversation? Yeah, I think like was she like, uh, oh, okay. Well, she, you know, she's she does the role I think that a, a partner plays as in an artist where you you say, No, you're you're great. No, you're Mozart. You must relate to Mozart. <laughs> yeah. Not Salieri. And I go, No. I uh but I think every artist, most artists, have a uh, a talent complex mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. uh with, with varying degrees of justification for them mm-hmm. to feel that way. And I don't know, for me. 
this was before I, I, I was I watched this and fell in love with this movie before I was doing stand up comedy, but I, <laughs> I was singing and I was acting. Okay. And I, I I went to college for musical theater and I at the time, especially singing, I was mm-hmm. like I would practice hours and hours every day to, mm-hmm. to a degree that like later I would, my therapist would say, you have mild OCD. And I'd be like, oh, that makes sense. Okay. With the way that I would practice and the way I would be so neurotically fearful of hitting wow. that high note. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And um, I, I remember just distinctly feeling, with acting too, but with singing, it was very visceral in terms of like some people just had- <sighs> Yeah. This ability. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, it, it, it was something that I strove so hard for. But ultimately, I, I left singing. I mean, uh-huh. it, it, took, it took four years and $200,000 of a college degree <laughs> to realize it. Um, but, but I related to Salieri. I mean, I assume the listeners know, but, but I guess to, to break it down, Salieri. Yeah, go for is, it. He's, he's basically... Uh, a musician in, is it Vienna? He's the court uh, composer in the King's Court in Vienna. Yes. It's such it's such a great movie. Also, I was saying to my, because my girlfriend's a, a manager. She's a comedy manager. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting how um, a Mozart's father is is uh, compelling one of the kings, please take my son as your commission. Mm-hmm. And I was like, and he's kissing the king's ring. And I said to Tova, I'm like, that's what, your role would have been. You would have been <laughs> yeah. the going to the royalty and your role as a manager would be to kiss the ring and say, uh, there's a couple clients I wanted to flag for your attention to consider. Mm-hmm. And you see how there was a time where art, religion, and government was all the same. And all I said, like, how, what would you think if if the head of, of arts and entertainment was Joe Biden? <laughs> like that yeah. was part of his slate. <laughs> Joe Biden com- <laughs> decided what was the slate NBC's uh, comedy yeah. block on Thursdays. Yeah. It was Biden's. And then it was Trump's before that. I mean, it's. Yeah. And he was it, also programming the Met for the national for national operas. And it's still there to a degree. Every time I see the president at the Kennedy Center Honors, I yep. go like these. This is the echoes of mm-hmm. royalty being involved. Why the <laughs> fuck? Why the fuck is the president there? This is a it great makes question. no sense. <laughs> it's, these things should be more divided, but somehow, only at the top does does uh, uh, Obama give Ellen DeGeneres the the thing of honor. It's a weird. It's a weird intersection. Yeah, it is. Uh, so so Amadeus. <laughs> It, it compares these two worlds where Mozart is like this child prodigy mm-hmm. and and he's he wrote an opera at 12 mm-hmm. and he his father parades him around to kingdoms and they put on a blindfold and he plays an incredible concerto or whatever. And meanwhile, Salieri loves music, has a family that doesn't support it. Mozart. I can't think of a time when I didn't know his name. I was still playing childish games when he was playing music for kings and emperors, even the Pope in Rome. I admit I was jealous when I heard the tales they told about him. Not of the brilliant little prodigy, but of his father, who had taught him everything. My father did not care for music. When I told him how I wished I could be like Mozart. He would say, Why? Do you want to be a trained monkey? Would you like me to drag you around Europe doing tricks like a circus freak? <laughs> how could I tell him what music meant to me? His father dies and, and somehow it seems like in his teenage years he's able to pursue music. And he, he goes, he works his way up. Yeah, to and he, he leaves like Italian countryside town to go be part of like the the wigged class of Vienna in the, its hallowed halls. Yes, and they, they don't really get into like his journey, but mm. but I, I think they you imagine like he worked his way up. Yes. And he was like, he was a good Christian. He he likes sweets, which is such a glorious detail. But <laughs> yes. But he was like, he never like, had sex with other women. He never abused his power. He worked his way up. Mm-hmm. He, he's, he was a brown noser and he was like, he knew how to play the game. 
And there's that great moment where he says in it when he because the the movie is unfolds as he's in his very old age reciting what he has done in his life to a clergyman. And he says like he describes the sort of like the salad days of his life. And he says, like, people liked me. I liked myself. Yes. Work and work and work. That was all my life. And it was wonderful. Everybody liked me. I liked myself. Until he came. And it's heartbreaking when you're like, and soon you're not going to, and you're about to tell me why. And it opens with, it opens with a suicide attempt, uh-huh. which like you already, you already got me for the movie. I'm already like, <laughs> why? Tell me why. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, and he basically he's, he's doing well. He's composing. He enjoys his life. He likes himself. Then Mozart comes around and it's like, Salieri witnesses what true greatness is. Mm -hmm. I know your work well, Signore. Do you know I I actually composed some variations on a melody of yours? Oh, really? Which one? Mio caro adonne. I'm flattered. A funny little tune, but it yielded some good things. And now he has returned the compliment. Herr Salieri composed this little march of welcome for you. Really? Oh. Grazie, signore. Sono commossa. And, and like in the most humiliating way possible, he he composes a little tune for Mozart to meet the king, and and Mozart like, oh, what a cute little trifle. Let me. Yeah. This part doesn't really work. Let me fix it. And then with like in moments, he's created a masterpiece. <laughs> yeah. And that's drawing um, a crowd in the court. And it's this really interesting. Uh, again, it's it's about show business in many ways. It's mm-hmm. show business and art. Where like Mozart is loved, but but one of the kings says that's ah, too many notes. Yeah, and Mozart yeah. is like, "What the too fuck do you mean too many notes?" <laughs> Mozart knows he's a genius, yeah. and he's like, and Salieri knows he's a genius. Yes, and that's the thing. So Salieri like knows, and and uh, uh, Mozart doesn't know how to play the game. He can't hand. He can't stand it. He's a little bit unhinged because he's a genius. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I've met. I don't know if I've met someone that I would consider like a Mozart, but I've certainly met people that I'm like, you're a genius. Yeah. And some of them don't know how to play the game. Mm -hmm. And, and Salieri ultimately is in this position of power, which he uses to block Mozart or make Mozart's life very difficult Mm -hmm. while also uh, uh, communing with Mozart as, as, as like a, 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 a peer, uh, uh, and there's a also friend. there's probably no greater like in the wor- universe of this of this movie there's no greater fan of Mozart than Salieri. Yeah, there's exactly. no one who wants to hear Mozart's work more than Salieri. Who wants to see his compositional scores? Like no one wants to be closer to the work of Mozart than Salieri, and no one hates and resents and loathes him more than Salieri. Yeah, and and I think it's like it's accompanied by. I mean, at some point in the movie, he really does give up on himself. But there's, yeah. there's, there's. I think the 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 really heartbreaking part is is where Salieri, like, he wants to be great. He yeah. wants he more than anything. He wants to sing to God. And and there's this, and I think it's like the, the, the where Salieri is really blind. Like he says, he wants to be. He thinks that he's selfless, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. he's not. Mm-hmm. Because he wants to be the vessel, and it's yes. it's it's for me. If I were to think, I have many vices, but for <laughs> me, uh, my my honest vice that I mm-hmm. think is number one is envy. Okay, okay. envy is 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 uh, it's just deep within me. There's mm-hmm. there's a there's a, and that's what I resonate with. That it's it's a story about like it's not good enough to witness God's miracles. You yeah. want to be the vessel for them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and Salieri cannot accept his place, mm-hmm. and so he does a mix of things. He he tries to to write things. He tries to be great. He tries to block Mozart and mm-hmm. ultimately regrets it. Yeah. Uh, but by by the end of the movie, the the spoiler alert is you know he's he's kind of fucked up Mozart's life. Mozart dies young, uh, youngish. Still creates some great works. Yeah. And and ultimately. Uh, if I remember correctly, I rewatched last night, but it was the director's cut and it's yes. eight hours. Same. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, 
I believe at the end he 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 kind of accepts his fate and goes mm-hmm. mediocrity, mediocrity. Yeah. We're all mediocrity. Yeah, he's he basically <laughs> describes himself as like the Lorax of mediocrity. Like I am here to speak for the mediocre. Like he looks at the clergyman. He's and, and he's like, I see you. We are the same. Like don't worry, I absolve you, my mediocre brethren. And he's being wheeled through. He's in like it's a prison, a sanitarium, a combination of the two. And he's being wheeled through this like hallway with people just like scrounging around on the ground and it's just like depraved and kind of a nightmare. Mediocrity is everywhere. I absolve you. I absolve you. Like me and you and all of all those around us who are mediocre, like I bless you in the name of being your champion. And he just like is losing his mind, old and dying, has just tried to kill himself by cutting his own throat and is like, I am the patron saint of the mediocre. And it is wild. <laughs> and the, the, the first thing, if I ever were to like interview Peter Schaefer, who wrote it, mm-hmm. I would say, do you consider yourself a part of mediocrity and yeah. and it's like you know I, I think if you're if you're being like kind to yourself and, uh-huh. and good mental health you go oh it's a, it's a wide spectrum and and there's no such thing as the the top and the bottom and the genius and the mediocre <laughs> and and but but that's that's what this piece is about is to witness I think about uh Beyonce a lot and, uh-huh. and there was just some clip that leaked from her concert for uh was oh, it dubai. where was it dubai yeah <laughs> and you know uh, problems aside with but but there's this one final riff that she does singing and there's a degree where you're like you are uh a godlike level there's yeah. no and it's 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 a mix of insane talent and work ethic but yes talent but talent but talent. talent no there's hard work doesn't you can't be Beyonce without the hard work, but hard work doesn't make you Beyonce. Of course. And that's what that's where I relate to Salieri in that, like, first it was with singing where I was like, I am going to practice so hard mm-hmm. that I I will be this great singer. And like, I think at the end of the day, I mm-hmm. realized they didn't have the vessel to to sing what I wanted to sing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's harder to tell with the voice because it's internal. If right, you wanted right. to be the best basketball player in the world and you were three foot five, <laughs> there is going to be a part of you that goes like, you know what? I, I The writing's on the wall and yeah. I can't even see the writing because it's too high up. But with singing, it's like, you don't know. You, yeah. you think maybe you'll get better. People do get better. And that's mm-hmm. that's what's so tricky. <laughs> People <laughs> yeah. do get better. Yeah. But I I hit a wall of like, oh, I'm not going to be what I want, what mm-hmm. I consider to be great. Mm-hmm. And it was the same with acting, where it was mm-hmm. like acting, you know, I still act here and there. But there was a time I wanted to be uh, a Daniel Day-Lewis. I wanted to be, right. uh, I wanted to be the vessel for, if it's not God, then it's just like greatness. What is greatness? Yeah. Well, I decide. I know yeah. it when I see it. And, um, and now I'm in stand up comedy and I, and I love stand up comedy. And I think there is a, a refuge where their stand up comedy of, of all the art forms, mm-hmm. and there's similar ones where the best is not always clear. Yeah. It's, 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 you do want some variety. It's, mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. not quite, but of course, I still will see comics where I go, fuck, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's astounding. Well, and, and so my my question then is like, because obviously in the movie, like Salieri's, he just he declines further and further. He's driven to madness. His moral character is completely corrupted. He does terrible, like he does compromising things to to Mozart and to Mozart's wife, and he's just a scoundrel. But like and you've said, like in his own mind, he like still maintains some sort of moral high ground, but he's just deteriorating. And what is? What is your response to these points of inflection in your life? Or you, you don't appear to be deteriorating before me. But so, like, what is what becomes the moment of resolve at the moment of awareness when you're like, here I have reached a limit I previously did not want to know that was my limit, but here it is, and here's how I'm going to go forward. What has been your going forward mentality? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly this is uh – Salieri's time was was there was a real lack of therapy. It's only <laughs> it's only after a suicide attempt do they get a priest and have the closest thing to therapy. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I 
I, I think I for me, like Salieri, whether I identify or not, he is like the warning. He's like what I don't want to be. Right. Mm-hmm. Or or he is, but I have to figure out how to manage. I think I think it's it's hard. It, it is a it is a lifelong struggle. Mm-hmm. And uh with stand-up comedy particularly, like mm-hmm. the the journey is can I enjoy someone else's talent yeah. without seeing it as a threat? Not just a threat, but also like pr- proves to me that what I suck. Yeah, that's that's where the thought goes. And I, and I've always been this. My mom would say, I think it was with anything, just like she'd be like, you know, someone else doing well doesn't mean you're doing badly. So right. this has always been a part of my DNA. Okay, there's okay. something in me that that, and it's 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 a toxic flaw that I I I recognize. Um, and my therapist, we talk about sometimes how. Uh, it is a useful trait in mm-hmm. some respects. It's made yeah. me work very hard and get better at the thing I want to do. Yeah. But it's like, for me, the real test is like, can I watch stand up comedy? Mm-hmm. Is someone else doing great and laugh? Because mm-hmm. for me, laughing is the true, like you've truly will given yourself over to it. You're, <laughs> yes, you're letting yes. your body. And it's, it's, it's brutal. It's just tough. I have good days and I have bad days. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, my 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 girlfriend is is very uh, patient with me when I'm going through those bad days. And every yeah. I mean, it's it's been the burden. Not not that any of my ex girlfriends want to go hang out together. <laughs> but, but if they if they wanted to like right. really connect, they could really connect over. Oh my god, what a nightmare he was after a, a bad set, or uh-huh. he cracked on a high note, or his acting scene sucked because uh-huh. it was all the same. Whether mm-hmm. whatever the discipline it was, it was just that feeling of the the conflict is not being able to accept mm-hmm. what Salieri ultimately does mediocrity which again I'm not going to pretend like I I go around being like I'm mediocre and that's fine <laughs> I'm the <laughs> spokesman for mediocrity no problem <laughs> but the but his conflict what drives him mad is mm-hmm. he knows he's mediocre but he still thinks but maybe I could be great mm-hmm. yeah and that's the that's the conflict mm-hmm. um and there's a part of him where he's like no but I know the truth yeah I'm not a genius and uh, uh, and the other conflict he has is like he he hates Mozart, but he loves it so much. He's at every he's at pain. every performance of Mozart's the va- from the vaudeville to the to the state opera house. Like he will he tells him, and it is true. Like I wouldn't miss a Mozart performance. It is just the lifelong struggle, and uh-huh. it's it's like there's external things where there's a degree of like tell someone who got the thing or did mm-hmm. the thing who did really well tell them good job even though yeah. inside you want to say you want to go do i suck was <laughs> i okay was my set okay oh uh, is it is it because i went first like there's there's a degree where you don't have to feel it to be to to do the right thing you uh-huh, you, you can uh-huh. feel the bad feeling there, I mean, Mozart has that moment in this movie when he watches Salieri conduct and then he goes to him afterwards and he's like, he's, he's, he's Salieri's like, you flatter me because Mozart's kind of complimenting him. Then he's like, you know, people will hear it and they will just think this could only be Salieri. And Salieri takes that, like, you can feel him being taken aback and you can feel Mozart being like, the only thing I can say is you did this and people will know you did this <laughs> and <laughs> it doesn't mean the same thing the way Salieri is receiving it the way Mozart is saying it and that's like Mozart is also a dick like Mozart Mozart's is like, like many geniuses he, he he's been spoiled in a way and but in a way he knows the truth he's like I don't think Mozart Mozart's not capable of lying in this yeah I mean, he tries no. but I don't think Mozart could go to Salieri and say hey that new song was great. No. He can't do that. No. And he's not wrong. It's not gr- great. It's not great. It is time for us to take a quick break. Then we will be back with more John Marco, more Salieri, and eventually one quick thing, a little follow-up to last week's talk about the Oscars. Now the nominations are behind us. We're just going to tie that up in a bow at the end of the show. So stick around. Dear Reading Glasses, it's been years since I've been able to read. I missed it so much, but I had no idea where to start. I felt so overwhelmed. 
But thanks to your show, now I'm back to enjoying books again and feeling like a reader. Love, Sarah. Yeah, that's an email we actually answered. Okay, maybe not that email specifically, but one just like it because most of our listeners are named Sarah. (laughs) We're Reading Glasses and we're here to solve all your reader problems. We give advice, help you find books you love and discuss reading without making you feel pressured. No matter what you read or how you read it, we'll help you do it better. Reading Glasses, every week on Maximum Fun. What happens when you give a bug recreational drugs? What was the first recorded sound? How do we figure out how old the Earth is? Let's find out together on our show, Let's Learn Everything, where we learn anything and everything interesting. My name's Caroline, and I studied biodiversity and conservation. My name's Tom, and I studied computer science and cognitive blah, 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 blah. Mm, Did you? <laughs> <laughs> and my name's Ella, and I studied stem cells and regenerative medicine. On our show, we do as much research as you would for a class, but we don't get in trouble for making each other laugh. And we get to say f**k. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not in the trailer. Subscribe to Let's Learn Everything every other Thursday on Maximum Fun. Welcome back to Feeling Scene. Comedian John Marco Sorezi and I have been talking about one of the great envious artists of cinema history, Antonio Salieri, as played by F. Murray Abraham who won both a Golden Globe and an Oscar for the role, deservedly so. So, let's get back into it. I know exactly the feeling you're talking about of, like, say you go and see a set and you're like, fuck, it's so... And my thing is, like, I have a preposterous amount of self-confidence in the things that I know I'm really fucking good at. And I'm not saying it's everything, but I know the specific lanes that I'm really good. One of those things is, like, I really love doing, like, a Q&A, like, a post-show Q&A, like, after a movie. To the point you're where... You're the Mozart of post-movie q and I fucking might be, man. I might be. <laughs> to the point where I will walk out before any of them start because I'm annoyed I'm not doing it instead of that person. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Because I'm like, you and I am almost never justified in staying if I do. Rarely it happens, but there was there was a uh, there was a retrospective for L Fanning at the Aero Theater here in Los Angeles. Uh-huh. I would love to listen to a conversation with L Fanning that I moderate. I <laughs> simply could not even attend it because I was not the one doing it. Hilarious. And while I regret not having seen this conversation, I have no regrets for not sitting there in the audience being jealous, like toxically jealous and certain of my superior execution in the form. So like that's that's where it becomes toxic for me is I will remove myself from situations where it's like I'm so certain of the inability of this person to perform in this micro way that I will not even participate in a thing I want to do because yeah. it's going to rub me the wrong way. I Whereas otherwise like fucking sports growing up, I was the number one support cheerleader person on the team cuz I was just okay. I am a just okay athlete. So my job was like being the hype machine. My job was to back everybody else up because I worked so goddamn hard and I was never going to be better with my slow hands than fine. For me, for sure. That's for me, like fun activities when I like what I want to do with friends. I like, I like things where I don't feel, oh, I got to be the best at this. Uh And for me, that's where like I can feel very joyful. Almost nothing do I feel like I have to be the best at this, but there are probably like three extremely niche things where I feel like I do. Everything else, I'm like, yeah, it's all fun and games. Let's have a good time. But if yeah. it's one of those three things, it's like, mm-mm, mm-mm. I'm going to be a bitch about this if I go. So let's just take me out of the equation because yeah. this is a Jordan problem. This is not the problem of anybody else who's participating in this situation. Absolutely. But I think we are, it's a fascinating like, I think there's such a, as someone who is just fine looking, like we're not going to get into a referendum on this, but I, I am here to represent, I've like decided in the past year that I want to be very proudly mid because it's fucking fine to just look average. It's, there is, it is the <laughs> bulk of existence for people to just look all right. And they don't have to be extraordinary looking, but there is such a lionization of sort of everybody's famous for 15 minutes, be like the best thing that you are, be ultra attention getting at the thing you do. It kind of makes like, it kind of makes being mid in stigma 
like uh-huh. worse than being bad. And sure. it's like, no, guys, I want to spearhead a movement of being just okay and that being totally fucking great, man. It is think, great to be just okay sometimes. I think Proudly Mid would work as merch for sure. <laughs> Really am. I've got no problem with it because it's completely fine. And I am here to be the appreciator, the supporter, the the heir into the fire of the extraordinary. And that is what I will be better at than anybody else. I wish I could share your sentiment. I would like to be uh, <laughs> top, the top. And you know what I always, when I, when I used to do, when I was really wanted to be a great actor, I would say, and again, this is, I, and I vacillate. I listen, there's times when I have a good set, you catch me at the right moment. I think Good. I'm Mozart. I Fuck think I'm yeah. Mozart. Fuck yeah. I want but, you to have those times. But I remember when I was acting and I wanted to play Salieri, I said, you know what the great irony is? <laughs> that the, the genius actor is going to book Salieri over me to yeah. portray <laughs> what I'm feeling in my life. Yeah. Ooh, that's, that's, a, that's brutal. That's, that's, the, that's, the true, that's the true pain of <laughs> art. I ain't just, you know, I've, oh man. Um, it does. F. Murray Abraham is giving like a defining performance in this role as somebody who is fine and like has to come to terms with being fine. But you have to be so good to sell being just fine and, in and a situation like this. I think that's what's tough about like, luckily, every, I, I was saying to my girlfriend last night, neither of us know music very well. Mm-hmm. And so there is a part of us where we ask like Mozart was clearly a genius. But we all know that that uh, things standing the test of time is a mix of genius and luck and yes. you were in the right place at the right time. And there's a degree of like, was he untouchable? Yeah. Is his legacy? It's the same with like Shakespeare, mm-hmm, where it's mm-hmm. like, well, was he this like untouchable? He was clearly a genius. But yeah. was he like the the greatest of all time? Or is it just even Beyonce? Like, I'm sure there are some insane talents that never got their full shot. Sure. And um, I think what's hard, though, is about like that that profession, this composer thing is like, there was a very small bench for mm-hmm. the great ones. I mean, yeah. how many composers of operas can there can there be? Uh, and, and now these days, like again with stand up comedy, mm-hmm. there is no one greatest stand up comedian. Well, the monoculture is obliterated. The, yeah, the the idea that like that like Maria Bamford or Earthquake and John yeah. Mulaney or Jesselyn couldn't all be on the same bench. They're all they're all great, but I think. Some of these professions, and this is why, like, Black Swan would be the other one mm. that, you know, they're the very cliche arts movies that I'm into. Right, but, like, right. Black oh, Swan is that. I'm, I'm the fucking mark for those. Neon Demon is one of my favorite movies of all time. I've never seen that. Neon Demon? <laughs> the Neon and L Fanning special. Nicholas Winding Refn's, like, portrait, uh, bisexual lighting soaked portrait of the beauty industrial complex in of Los Angeles. Okay, I'll put that on my list. You for got, sure. oh, yeah, you got to go in for that. Can't say you'll um, like it, but I can say it's in this vein. Sure. But like Black Swan is a similar thing where like the the hierarchy is much more clear, I think, yeah. in ballet. If you expand it to dance, it's bigger. Right. But in ballet, there's a degree of like, no, that's the greatest of all time. <laughs> and your ensemble at the Met. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, which is great. <laughs> which is great. That's which fantastic. is great. Which makes you still the elite. And they will buy your shirt. I mean, the thing about your proudly <laughs> mid shirt is it really, uh, percentage wise, should market to a lot of people. A lot of people, the bulk, really. But I don't know if they'll they'll buy it. They'll only buy it and wear a sweater on top of it, so no one knows. <laughs> that should be the sweater on top. Says like you know I'm the top. And then when they get home and they take off their layers, they go, No, I'm a mid. <laughs> no, this is this is me in my never nude proudly mid shirt. Yes. I, well, and that's that's such a, like what you were saying about like your ensemble at the Met and you're still the elite if that is you. And that is a, that's such a tricky thing about entertainment, like from the era of Mozart to the present. Like if you make it to a certain threshold of like exposure and peer level within this industry, you are of the elite. You are like, even if, if you are a G League basketball player, you are f- one of the best fucking basketball players in this nation. But yep. you're still the G League of the NBA. So you're in the G League looking at the NBA thinking about, like, that's got to be me. Like, I want that rotation spot. I want to be on that bench. I want to have that Gary Payton Jr. story. But, like, by comparison, your greatness next to the elite of the elite 
it's really easy to lose track of like how good you are and how accomplished you are and all the things you can do when it's like, oh yeah, but like the thing that people all think I'm supposed to be is Sam Kinison. Like sure. is, is Jerry Seinfeld, is Maria Bamford. It's like, fuck, I'm really good at what I do, but like the elite, elite, elite are the ones you can see. It's a really fucking head-screwing metric to have to evaluate yourself against. And I think the thing with Salieri that again is so interesting is like, all the people in charge, they do love him. Yes. They think he's delightful. And like, yes. it doesn't fucking matter for one second to him. It doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter if every king in Europe said, you are the greatest composer of all time. No. It doesn't, doesn't matter. No, it absolutely does and not. And I think he has a pain of like, again, this is all the ways I relate to Sally. Or what's like, I, I know that child actors have a tough lot in life. Yeah. I'm aware of that. <laughs> However, I still have this fantasy and this like thing of I wish my parents had seen the the true love I had for performing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as I expressed it mm-hmm. and fucking sent me to an arts high school or or or, or Again, and you look back and you're like, well, some people drop out of college on their own accord or drop out of high school on their own accord. Right. But, but, and, and so I, I, I know it's not fair to just be like, fuck you, mom and dad. But <laughs> I have a fantasy where I'm like, I would have, I could have been in those fucking Disney series. Yeah. I, like if I, I had and, gone to the professional children's school, that could have been me. I could have, I could have been Emmy Rossum. Yeah. Or, or I wish that, you know, put me in the lessons right away. And I think yeah. there also is this degree where like, not only is Mozart a genius, but also he like started from the time he was like a little boy and Salieri yeah. started late. And mm-hmm. I can certainly relate to that. I mean, I feel it was stand up even where I know people who started when they were in high school or mm-hmm. college. And I go, yeah. I started at like 26, 27. Uh-huh. And, I, and I feel, uh, again, it's, it's, and I, you know, when you say this stuff to people, sometimes it really bothers me where people, they go like, no, 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 you're great. Or no, 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 it's not too late. And it's like, that's not what it is. The feeling still is there though. The feeling is there. Mm -hmm. And, and if you don't talk about it, you just feel it what alone in your room. And it, it just, it it weighs you down. No, I know exactly. Time does tick tick dictate the shape of your opportunities. And there's a particular kind of impatience that comes with getting started later than your peer group on things, because you are sort of you are sort of robbed of the luxury of trial and error a bit if you transition to a different kind of career later in life. So it's like, no, I need to sprint the marathon right fucking now. And if I just don't externalize the particular challenge of that and the ways that like my opportunities are not diminished, but I am behind the starting line a bit. Then, like you said, is it just supposed to sit there and fester and like turn into Salieri inside and not tell anybody of my private pain? No, yeah. Yeah. gotta I gotta get that shit out there. Yeah, and and this was at a time where like Salieri has no one but but his cross. No one talking to God. He just talks to God. And then he puts that fucking cross in the fire. I said, I said, to, I said to my girlfriend last night. I said, I I do it. I could put a cross <laughs> in a fire. I could do it. And, and I, I and, and it, but there was a feeling of like, you're like, whoa, <laughs> you can't do that. You can't put a Jesus in the fire. From now on, we are enemies. You and I. Because you choose for your instrument a boastful, lustful, smutty, infantile boy. And give me for reward only the ability to recognize the incarnation. Because you are unjust, unfair, unkind, I will block you. I swear it. I will hinder and harm your creature on earth as far as I am able. Yeah, like I, with no affiliation whatsoever, I was, I, I like felt the fear of being smited, regardless of what my own beliefs or, or connections it's might be. It's amazing how it's like, that Holy deep it is. shit. I remember one time in high school, I don't know why I did it, but I was like, I was just being stupid. I like looked at the sky and I was like, fuck you, God. And, <laughs> and then I remember being like, I'm sorry, God, I was just saying a joke. Like I had to, <laughs> I had to. And it really, and I fight it now. Whenever like something, the number 13, of course uh-huh. the thought goes in my head. I go, no, <laughs> you do the 13 of that thing. Yeah, yeah. 
there's there is the beautiful moment for Salieri where he gets to finally like compose alongside he gets to dictate a composition of Mozart's right on the doorstep of Mozart's death. Now the orchestra, second bassoon and bass trombones with the basses, identical notes and rhythm. First bassoon, tenor trombones with the tenors. <laughs> Go too fast. Do you have it? Go too fast. Do you have it? First bassoon, tenor, trombone, what? With the tenors. Identical? Of course. The instruments I... doubling the voices. Now, trumpets and timpani. No. Trumpets and D. No, no. D listen no, to me. I don't understand. Listen. Trumpets and D. Tonic and dominant. First and third beats. It goes with the harmony. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, I understand. Yes, yes. And that's all. No, no, not for the real fire. Being inclined toward envy or inclined toward a, a state of measurement against others, how do you find as your strategy for embracing the moments where you, you do have your, Mo your Mozart moments? You're like, you know what? I I was fucking Mozart tonight. Yeah, I think it's very much like with it's in the moment of performance itself. Mm -hmm. It's it's when that joke works for the first time. It's when you have like a killer headlining set on your own. Mm -hmm. It's only in that moment, though, because I think what happens for me, at least, is like you, you get some kind of accomplishment, like let's say late. I, I did James Corden last year mm -hmm. and and then everyone comes up to you and they go. Wow! Hey, you got that thing, and it's like it—it it already doesn't feel like a, a thing anymore. It was a thing that happened. It was—it was—it right. was, was a gig. It's—it's it's helped. It's uh, maybe put more income in my pocket, or it's—it's yeah. it's helped me get into some clubs. But it's like in the moment, it's—it's it's a dead thing. It's just a fact. Mm. It's just mm -hmm. a fact of a thing that I did. Where you where you feel it is is in the moment of of performing. There, mm -hmm. when I'm in that groove. It doesn't matter if I'm at even a shitty comedy club, but if I'm like really just some new bit comes together or I have some moment with an audience member where I thought of a funny thing and the audience mm -hmm. just went wild, that's <laughs> that's the really great thing. And, and sometimes it's like, you know, that's where um, – my girlfriend is very busy as a manager and, and she's mm. she's like she couldn't be at James Corden or she couldn't mm -hmm. be at at some things and, and I always tell her like like sometimes those things aren't the ones that I want people to have uh, bore witness to my loved mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. Like I it means more for a loved one to see me like a killer set she was at in Magoobies in, in mm -hmm. Baltimore. And it's like that's more meaningful because you got to see me like I wasn't thinking about my career. I was right. just like in the moment and and doing my thing. And it feels good to have a loved one who witnessed that. Yeah. And you can be like, remember that thing? It felt so good. <laughs> yeah. But again, like I, I experience all the time where I have these weekends where mm -hmm. I bet in Magoobies, I bet in Timonium, Maryland that mm -hmm. weekend, I was the best stand-up comedian in Timonium that weekend. <laughs> yeah. I would, That's I right. would wager. Yes. I'm confident enough to say that. And then you come back to the comedy cellar and like sometimes I'm feeling great. And then mm -hmm. I have that, that set and I see, uh, you know, uh, uh, Daniel Simonson or, or Shane Gillis or Caitlin mm -hmm. Palufo or so many comics go up and I go, fuck, fuck. <laughs> I was lying to myself. Oh, no. I lied to, I lied to myself all weekend. I was a fool. <laughs> I'm the best of Timonium, and that's all I'll ever be. I should go back to Timonium. And and again, like I, I can talk myself down from those ledges most of mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. But um it's 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 hard. And that's why I I can I can relate to Salieri and I want to avoid his fate. But at the same yeah. time, I'm in that place where I'm like, no, I'm gonna be a genius. Yes. And and thankfully, again, stand-up comedy is a place where that metric is mm -hmm. is looser. I, I yeah. do have moments where I feel like, no, that was a genius piece of stand-up mm -hmm. comedy. Mm -hmm. And and ultimately, you know, even the people who are considered legends 
uh, it's not like they get to like experience what their legendary status is. They're either dead, yeah, or or you no human being can feel whatever it is that you are bestowing upon them. They're just a person going about their day, shitting and eating, and then dying. Well, and, and we didn't memorialize their nights of self doubt in the comedy cellar. We saw their, we see the things course. that pervade through the cultural memory that just enshrine them. When those are a fraction of the times when they, I mean, in their in their comics, so I would imagine they had plenty of dark nights of the soul. And that's why it can feel so. I and again, I, I'm not a dick. When people say, mm-hmm. "Hey, congrats," I'm not like, "Hey, fuck you." Yeah. I'm actually doing bad. <laughs> Don't put that shit on me. But when people do that, and and I know, and I I've done it to people. It's it's uh, the natural response. Hey, you're killing it, dude. Yeah. <laughs> There's a part of it where it's like, oh, you don't know who I am. You don't know me, <laughs> and and you also can't express it because again, Salieri. If some you know up and coming composer said to Salieri, "You're amazing," yeah. they would never. Salieri would seem like a dick if he said, "Actually, I feel very sad. I know I'm yeah. the court composer, <laughs> and I'm paid a million bajillion dollars a year and eat all the candies I want, but I'm sad." Yeah, and I'm fueled by resentment. Yeah. And covetousness. They should do one for Beyonce. I I would like I can you imagine so it's it's uh, Amadeus but it's like uh is it Kelly Rowland? Kelly Rowland is Salieri. <laughs> oh and and Beyonce God. plays Mozart. Because again, she Kelly's amazing and I I always Incredible. wonder And and who knows? Who knows like We'll never know that, uh, you know, unless someone leaks her journals, which would be unethical. But like (laughs) part of you is like, what what was that like? I'm dying to know what it's like to be part of a group that A, is great. I I did a Beyonce uh, spin class the other day and some (laughs) Destiny's Child comes on and you're like, they were good. I remember this album. I remember Bill's Bill's Bill's. And and what was it like to, to like witness... And again, like Beyonce is not only she's so talented, but she also had a father who, who maybe maybe not in a good way, but also in a way that worked. <laughs> like you know, trained and, and said practice, forget uh-huh. school. You were gonna dance all day. You and, were and, dance all day. And it's it's. Uh, I don't know, and I, I don't know if Taylor Swift sees Beyonce and goes like, "I suck." Yes, I I broke Ticketmaster, but deep down. Beyonce is the greatest. I don't know. <laughs> right. I I I have to I have I've I've reached my time and I'm so sorry to have to conclude no our conversations because John Marco, this has been extremely fun and interesting. And I'm so grateful to you for coming on and being like, these are the ways in which I can be a petty bitch. Yeah. And this is why I've related to this character and this man. And I and having conversations about the fame ecosystem and like the existential ins and outs of the entertainment industry are one of my personal favorite things. So I really appreciate you joining me for this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much to Gianmarco Sorezi for bringing us a virtuoso performance to discuss today. F. Marie Abraham, what what a timeless role. We will put a link to where you can watch his stand-up online in the notes and such, including that appearance on The Late Late Show from last fall. And his podcast is called The Downside, which is all about the downsides of things. So uh, put a pep in your step with that. And now, the one quick thing before I go, last week was about bemoaning the certain lack of uh, recognition for horror film and genre film performances at the Academy Awards. The trend continues, as we know it would. Uh, Neither Mia Goth nor Rebecca Hall for any roles last year were in conversation for nominations, and they certainly did not get any. Uh, But we do want to revisit the conversation for just a moment, because we brought it up, the nominations have now come out, and let's just take a moment to say... Everything, everywhere, all at once, with 11 nominations. A pack leading 11 nominations. You know what that means, guys, that I'm just kind of thinking about as I'm saying it? That means Michelle Yeoh has been central to, I think, two of the most nominated films of the 21st century. With Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and now, 
everything, everywhere, all at once. Not that she received a nomination um, prior for that film, but that, like, that one swept in like a storm. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was a, a sensation. It was, it opened, here on, here on our shores at the very least, opened our eyes to sort of new possibilities in what action could look like, what action cinema could look like, what wuxia was. Like, and now, here we are, 20 some odd years later, Michelle Yeoh, the first, my God, the first Asian woman to be nominated for Best Actress, um, Stephanie Hsu, nominated for Best Supporting Actress, the recognition she really uh, should have been getting kind of this whole award season, but it was sort of hit and miss leading up to the to the noms, whether or not she would make the cut. And of course, our beloved friend of the show, past guest, Kiwi Kwan, nominated for Best Supporting Actor. Um, obviously, there are, there are just so many movies, and there are so many movies that should get the recognition at the Academy Award level that don't. I, I am heartbroken to not see the Woman King in for a nomination for Best Director or for Best Picture. No women nominated for Best Director this year. There we go. Um, as as I have been saying for months now, Lashana Lynch, Best Supporting Actress, um, it didn't look like it was going to go that way. Uh, so it was not a surprise to to see that not break in our favor uh, at Woman King Nation. But it for for what has been nominated... I just want to localize in on go get it, Barry Keegan up against Ki Hui Kwan in Best Supporting. What a tight rope that is in my heart. But, you know, I'm pulling Ki Hui Kwan all the way. Barry, you got another year in you. I know it. Uh, Colin Farrell, Banshees of Inisherin for the sad edit version of me. Uh, I kind of can't root for anything else in Best Actor but him. But everything, everywhere, all at once. Best Picture of the Year. Best movie of the year, most movie of the year, one in the same this time around. I hope the Daniels are gliding across that stage on Oscar night to pick up their well-received trophies and that Michelle Yeoh in particular gets the hardware she has earned over the course of her 60 years, decades and decades and decades of them spent in this business. I want to, I want to see her in front of God and everyone, uh, and Twitter get finally get that industry the proof not that Michelle Yeoh is good enough to win an Oscar but the proof that the voting body finally pulled its head out of its ass long enough to give her what she has deserved for years so yeah we're gonna focus on the positive and we're gonna say hell yeah everything everywhere uh 11 nominations leading this year's herd uh so excited for that movie and I'm excited to to root for a real for a real audacious piece of cinema that came out in like an early year release, Get Out style, and then marching all the way through one of those infinity press cycles to make it to the big stage, to make it to the dais. So that, we did it. We have come to the end once again. That is our show. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Pod, or you can send us an email at feelingscene at maximumfun.org. If you want to follow me, I'm Jorcru on Twitter. It's J-O-R-C-R-U. Our theme music is by Andrew Epen. The show is produced by Marissa Flaxbart. Our senior producers are Kevin Ferguson and Laura Swisher. And this is a production of Maximum Fun. MaximumFun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned, audience supported.